Texas Concrete Association in Silver Spring, Maryland. I'd like to welcome everyone to the this afternoon to our uh, Pave Ahead seminar. Um, and uh, let me first indicate that we are, of course, going to hold this uh, webinar in strict conformance with the NRMCA antitrust guidelines and in conformance with the Sherman and Clayton Antitrust Act. Uh, Brian, before we start, well, or when he starts, will tell you how you can ask questions. I believe we can ask questions during the presentation, and we'll certainly have time at the very end. But if you have questions during the presentation, please uh, bring them forward so we can we can uh, show them to everyone and get a response. Uh, this, of course, is the Pave Ahead portion. It's the local paving program for NRMCA. Um, and this program has been uh, our oldest, more of a legacy program that we've had compared to Build with Strength. We had started this in earnest back in 2003, and it's really gotten very mature and progressive in terms of its impact in terms of improving local paving, which is streets, roads, overlays, lower compacted concrete, intersections, and so forth, parking areas. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Killingsworth, our division executive vice president. Brian. Thank you, Bob. Um, we've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to jump right in and just uh, first show you what we're going to talk about today. Uh, just talk a little bit about the purpose of Pave Ahead and, and update you where we are there and that branding. And then we'll talk about in the local paving division what our progress has been over 2017 and, and where we uh, tend to go or want to go in, in 2018. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can use the, the question box or the chat box in your go to webinar panel. Uh, so throughout the webinar, if you want to add uh, a comment or question, we'll be monitoring that. So we'll be looking for those questions. And then, of course, at the end, we'll use uh, the, the raise your hand feature. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand um, through your webinar panel. Um, and then uh, we'll unmute you. We'll, we'll unmute you, allow you to ask that question, and, and then uh, mute you back. So let's uh, let's jump right into it. So the local paving division, we maintain the six regions across the U.S. Over the last um, about the last four months, uh, we had been without a representative in the uh, the Northeast and the Great Lakes region. In mid-October, we hired uh, Luke McHugh. He comes from the consulting world. He has a background in, in pavement design and concrete materials from the work that he he did in, in municipal airport design. So we're fully staffed in the local paving division across these six regions. So our market areas, as Bob mentioned, uh, it's the local paving market areas. It's parking lots and it's streets. Um, and we look towards um, uh, marketing those materials that are produced by our members. It's conventional concrete, roller compacted, pervious concrete, concrete overlays. And then, of course, full depth reclamation um, when we have the opportunity to uh, deliver slurry from a, a ready mix truck. So we market all of those markets. And again, it's important to note that, uh, you know, most of the, the promotion and technical support we do is in that local uh, level that's primarily the streets and roads and, and the parking lots. So it's not to say that we don't get involved at the DOT level. It, many times we do particularly when um, the DOT maintains some of those local streets, but uh, really our interactions are at the city, county, and in, in, in the private sector at the developer uh, level. Our sole purpose uh, and really what guides us is to help our members be successful, and being successful is being financially successful. So all that we do uh, is focused on increasing yardage in the marketplace, whether it's through design assistance or contractor partner partnering or any of those other activities. Really, our aim is to make ready mix products a viable alternative uh, in the paving market. That's, that's what we're looking for. The annual market potential that, that we estimate um, for the local paving market for ready mix producers, is, it's very significant. Um, there's uh, over 4 million center lane miles of roads in the U.S. More than 2.7 million of those center lane miles are paved. Each year, there's about um, just over 31,000 lane miles 
uh, added through new roads, widening, and, and really most of that capacity in, in the local road market is in the local road market. Um, so if you run some numbers, you know you can see some numbers here. There, the the potential in terms of yardage is is huge, and it, it's it's a, 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 a potential profit of of 3.3 billion dollars sitting out there for the ready mix industry uh, to go get. So that that really should motivate us all to go out and and go get those yards through our promotion, our technical support. I want to talk about the Pay the Head program a little bit um, and the reasons behind it. Uh, we know that, that that potential market is out there, um, but it, we believe it's important to understand what both public and private decision makers think about concrete pavements. Um, and if you look at the graph here, this was some research that was done for us um, through DDC. Um, asking questions about um, the paving market to both uh, public and private officials or decision makers. You can see overall users have very positive responses to concrete pavement, especially when we talk about uh, cost, strength, durability, length of life. Um, all of those had very, very positive responses. And then the respondents were asked to, to identify what they considered the biggest benefits or, or the, the largest negatives of using concrete, and you can see what those were here. A little under half had a negative reaction of cost, but on the reverse side of it, it also means that about 40% considered cost of, of ready mix products or concrete and pavement uh, is, as a benefit. So when you look at that, cost is not necessarily a significant, what we would call net negative. but um, we still see this number, uh, this five to eight percent, and what does that represent? It represents what our what our estimated concrete market share is in streets and roads. And when you talk about parking lots, the estimate is around ten percent. Um, and those numbers have remained steady uh, for a number of years. So our challenge really was to determine how we can make or take a new or a different approach to promotion, technical support, all those things that we do to increase that market share. We know the market's large. We still have a share that's in the single or, or low double digits. And so we need to find new ways of approaching that market. What, what we're doing is, is maintaining and not necessarily increasing market share. So this is where the pave ahead brand development uh, came in. So what I want to do is pass the screen over to Molly Harp with DDC, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, where we are with uh, the Pave Ahead brand and, and those associated um, uh, things that uh, the DDC is doing for us. So Molly, go ahead. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you all for the opportunity to let me present to you all today on the work that we have done on behalf of the NRMCA and the Pave Ahead Initiative. Um, um, as Brian touched upon, we wanted to leverage the polling research that we conducted and wanted to develop a new brand and focus that would emphasize that the decision to pay with concrete creates a durable and more sustainable future. And it was with that idea in mind that we developed the Pay the Head brand. It means we are thinking smarter, going beyond conventional methods, and leading the way in adopting new and innovative technology. Now, following the development of the new brand, our next step was to give you a sleek website that would serve as the home base for the Pay the Head initiative. We wanted to give you a responsive site that would function on desktop, so it would also look clean and crisp on mobile and tablet, so that you can take it anywhere with you. And I think it's important you know, for us to take a step back and to remember what the original goals were for the Pay the Head site. We wanted to showcase the expertise behind your design center and the human element of that expertise. We wanted to give you a tool that could go on the road with NRMCA and industry staff to sell people and to get them to sign up for the design center. And the Pay the Head website continuously directs users to that design center sign up page. So if you've had a chance to go on and look, which I hope all of you had, 
you, you will see that every page that you go to, you will see a button that directs you to the design center. It's at the top, it's at the bottom. You won't be able to get away from it. We are really driving folks there. And, and visitors to the site will see right away that they'll have a collaborative partner in Pave Ahead and that they'll have an expert team member who not only knows their region, but understands their project. Um, the website provides visitors access to resources and experts that can answer any of the questions that they have about their project. Um, and our goal is to showcase the various types of concrete paving projects in which NRMCA has expertise and prior experience. Um, and you'll also notice that it has a distinctive look and feel from the Build with Strength brand and site that, that you all have seen. Um, and as you can see on the screen here, uh, we've attached several screenshots from the site, you know, again, showcasing that design center. We have a product specific resource page. We have a video page. We have a page that'll have the, all the team of experts that we have. You know, again, our goal is just to create a highly visual product that offers users the tools and resources they need the most. Um, and in terms of the launch, um, once we had that website built, we wanted to move forward with the rollout of the initiative at large. And so, as you know, the Pave Ahead website was launched this fall. We then followed up with the Pave Ahead press release that was distributed to industry and trade press members. Um, next, we're pitching an op-ed by President Robert Garbini, announcing the initiative, the website, and highlighting the benefits of paving with concrete and using the design center. Um, and looking forward, you know, we've spent uh, the last year really building the foundational elements and promoting NRMCA's local paving program and establishing Pave Ahead as the authoritative voice in the industry. And following this initial launch, our efforts are now shifting to elevating the Pave Ahead brand. We're going to engage in a social media and digital campaign, and we're going to develop all Pave Ahead marketing collateral. Um, and as you can see here, um, I have a few examples um, of the kind of collateral that we're going to be making for you all. Here we have um, the four product overview, and we also have a handout that is focused on Pervious. Um, we're developing case studies, product specific handouts, and, um, and infographics. They're all going to be Pave Ahead branded, and they're going to showcase the benefits of paving with concrete. You know, and all this collateral that we develop will be promoted online on the website. You can push it on social media, you can take it into meetings. We have several videos that if you haven't seen them already, I, I highly recommend um, you go on and, and take a look. Um, you know, our goal, again, is just to show complex information in a clear and visually appealing way. Um, and so, you know, in, in conclusion, what you have is an initiative that really connects users to the information they need most for their paving project, from the design center, from these detailed resources on each of your products, the videos and handouts, social media capabilities. You know, it's really everything that you need to sell more concrete. Um, and with that, I, I thank you for your time and for the opportunity to work on this initiative. Very good. Thanks, Molly. All right. Very good. I, and I will say we, we're very, very pleased with, with the work that DDC has done for us, uh, particularly the, the website and, and the videos. Um, and I've gotten many, many comments from some of the other industry folks that, that I deal with and association folks that I deal with about how nice uh, the site is. I can tell you this, we, we've, we've already gotten um, uh, probably about a half a dozen uh, DAPs just from people coming to the website and seeing that there's the design center there and seeing that there's an opportunity to, to be able to reach out to one of us and, and ask for help on a project. So uh, with, with the design center and the, and the website there, we're, we're already seeing traffic come through it. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's working exactly as, as we intended. Um, okay, so I want to give an update a little bit on what we've done in 2017. The first thing we'll do is, is talk about project pursuits. Um, as you know, we, we, we really have been focusing these last uh, couple of years on identifying projects in which we can make concrete a viable uh, pavement alternative or, or a ready mix product a, a, a viable alternative. In 2017, up until a, about uh, the 1st of November, um, we have uh, pursued uh, 438 projects. It represents uh, about 3.7 million cubic yards of concrete. 
out of those pursuits, we've we've converted 157. That, that represents uh, about 927,000 cubic yards of concrete. We we had a goal this year of about uh, 1.2 million cubic yards, and we're at about 80% of, of that goal. Um, so within those projects that we have pursued and converted. Uh, 178 of those are actual projects where we've provided a design uh, proposal. Um, out of that 178, we've had 38 of those that, that we have converted. Um, we know based on previous averages and the average um, that we have for 2017 that, that about 60% of our DAPs result in, in concrete being selected and placed. So we know that this model works. If we can just get a report in the hands of somebody, they can take that to a decision maker. And generally that decision maker will choose concrete. Um, going back, looking at, at previous years where we've pursued uh, projects and decisions just haven't been made yet. Um, we've got about a million cubic yards um, sitting out there with, with unreported outcomes. So we've been doing, uh, these DAPs for the last several years, and, and there are still projects that we are per pursuing, and, and uh, we expect uh, several of those projects uh, to go concrete. Brian, Brian, this is this is Bob. Uh, yep. And these are incremental yards. These are yards that were not planned on by anyone that NRMCA influenced to get. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. All right. Yeah, we, we track and monitor those projects that we've had, that the promotion team has had a, a direct impact on uh, through our efforts of promotion and, and technical support. Just to show you kind of where some of these projects are, um, a graphic that shows the number of projects and the darker the color, the higher number of projects. Uh, so you can kind of see regionally where we're getting those, those projects from. And then out of those winds, you can see where those winds are coming from. And, and as you would expect, um, the winds uh, are coming from those states where we have the highest number of projects. Um, so to some degree, it is about volume. If we can, if we can identify projects and, and, and promote concrete, either through um, uh, just showing the benefits or providing a report, uh, again, we, we, we see a, a fairly good uh, hit rate uh, when we promote to those projects. So um, we, we are expecting in 2018 to continue up on that upward uh, trend uh, of, of yards. Our converted volume, you can see uh, we started kind of monitoring volume in, in the, the projects that we were converting in, in 2013. You can see over the years uh, we've had a steady increase. Um, as I mentioned before, we're about 80% of our goal this year. Uh, a couple of reasons why we're not quite uh, where we would expect would be uh, typically every year we have seen um, uh, November and December uh, people reporting back to us of projects um, that we've converted. So we tend to see our, our volumes increase in November and December. Um, and that's one reason. Another reason, you know, we were without uh, a promoter in that northeast region for uh, about four months or so. So um, we're a little behind the curve of where we would like to be at this point, but uh, I think uh, we'll be able to reach our goal or get very close to it uh, by the end of the year. When we look at that cumulative converted volume from 2013 to 17, you can see, you know, we're, we're making strides and we're increasing that volume. And, and as Bob mentioned, this is volume that wouldn't necessarily have counted. This is incremental volume uh, and it's a direct result of, of the work that we do and the promotion that we do. And, and uh, the other thing to mention is I always like to mention is, you know, there's many times when we go to a conference and we talk about uh, a specific product, whether it's Pervious or RCC or overlays, whatever the case may be, and people walk out of there better educated and go back and, and, and supply concrete as an option on a, on a project, and we just don't know about it. So our promotion efforts have, have um, unmeasured value as well. 
I like to talk about uh, contractor partnering a little bit. We believe that this is really one way of identifying projects and getting concrete as that, as that viable pavement option. We really believe that partnering with, with concrete contractors is, is a good way uh, to open some doors for us. Um, but we want to partner with, with the right type of concrete contractor. And these are typically contractors that are members of ASCC. They tend to have a, a, a lot of positive attributes that make them good partners. And what we've found specifically is that in most cases, the concrete contractors, they have closer relationships with the decision makers than we do. The contractors are open to both sales and construction education. So we can take the knowledge that we have from the concrete ready mix producer side and and help the contractors uh, during that uh, construction process when they're placing payment. Um, we find that they, they adopt innovation. If that innovation uh, makes them money, they very easily will, will, will invest in equipment and, and innovative type equipment. Um, you know, again, when, when, when they see a benefit to it. And when we work together with these contractors, we can kind of sharpen the pencil, as it were, on bids and become much more competitive on these projects. So we believe it's important to, to partner with the right type of, of contractor. And, and, and in fact, we've been, we've been doing that uh, through uh, the American Society of Concrete Contractors and NRMCA. We've, we've kind of led a charge in developing a joint paving committee. John Hansen has taken that ball and, and really run with it and, and had seen some successes in, in the partnering arena. Uh, they meet uh, in, in person uh, several times a year, on the phone several times a year. So there's a lot of communication going uh, around this joint paving committee. Uh, they've developed this plan of interaction for the producer and the contractor developing uh, right now a, a kind of a pavement toolbox um, for contractors and producers to use I'm talking about selling of concrete and and um, where to go for resources and how to support folks um, it, it really all of these these tools that we're, we're trying to provide each other um, are, are working towards fostering this relationship and being more competitive in these project pursuits Another way we help to develop these, uh, this relationship with the concrete contractors is through our selling of concrete parking lot boot camps. Uh, the boot camps, again, um, I think most people are familiar with them, but it's a, it's a concrete parking lot and selling the concrete parking lot uh, idea to those decision makers. It's one ready mix producer and one contractor that sits in a room um, for several hours and talks about how are we going to attack a particular market. Uh, last year we did eight boot camps with about 130 participants. This year we've done seven um, with about 80 per participants year to date. We've seen a little bit of a drop off in, in these boot camps. Um, various reasons why it could be that, that folks are just becoming busier and and they just don't see the need at this point to to continue to add market um, but I, I think that that continuing to do these boot camps is still a very positive thing to do um, I, I did hear today though that we've got uh, a couple of boot camps uh, coming up this uh, later this winter uh, we're working on uh, with a couple of producers to get those in place um, but again there's still time this year to get a boot camp in so uh, please contact me con uh, contact your regional promotion person and, and uh, get one underway if uh, there's something that you've wanted to do the cost of the boot camp is very low um, the expenses are typically just for paying for travel some food and refreshments for the attendees and potentially a conference room cost if you have a conference uh, room at a hotel but they're really low when you consider the potential return from winning just a few uh, parking lot projects um, uh, after doing some of these boot camps and that's what we see after a boot camp is done we see a, a kind of a, a tick up in our converted projects just because of the fact that uh, folks have set out and gone out and aggressively uh, looked for uh, opportunities. So we're gonna move on to uh, education. 
Uh, again, remember, if you've got a question or comment that you want to make, just put that in the chat or the questions box and, or raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll address those. So from the education standpoint, last year um, we were at various uh, um, conferences and, and had various uh, education opportunities, over 100 presentations and training sessions and seminars. Uh, educating about 2,300 professionals this year in, in 2017. Again, about the same number of presentations that we've done to this point, around 100 or so. Uh, educating, um, the last number was uh, about 3,200 professionals. So uh, again, we're still out there trying to educate people on how to design, uh, teaching people how to promote. Uh, the education program touches on um, technical topics as well as promotional type topics. Uh, and we're, again, we're finding success when we're at some of these education seminars. <clears throat> we always, always, always promote the design assistance program and, and the design center. And invariably after um, any one of us speaks after one of these uh, conferences, we'll have somebody come up to us or a number of people come up to us after the uh, the session and, and talk to us about doing a DAP. So they're, they're very worthwhile events to, to be at and to educate folks with. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about the technical resources available and in particular what we've been doing recently. Um, we identified a need, um, it's been identified for a number of years, um, about how to quickly identify concrete parking lots and streets in a region or a city or a state, uh, invariably, um, when we're talking to somebody about a project, um, they'll ask, where can I see one? Where's one in my area? And so we've been developing what we call this concrete tracker. It's a website um, where we are populating um, these projects that we're doing, whether it's a DAP or a non-DAP project. We're, we're trying to highlight uh, parking lots, streets and roads, things that we've done in the past so that folks can go out and go see um, some of these projects um, and that we can kind of keep track of performance of these of these projects. So we have that launched, it's at concretetracker.org. And over the next several months, we'll be adding uh, many more projects to the database. Um, so we'll see many more pins across uh, the states. Uh, very easy to um, go through and, and um, search for projects, search for certain types of projects, whether it's RCC, conventional, roller compacted, or um, uh, overlays, uh, that type of thing, parking lot streets. Um, so it's very easy to, to search through a, a region or a state. Another thing that we've been working on in near conclusion is the pavementdesigner.org website. This is the uh, design, uh, the pavement design software that we've been working on with the Portland Cement Association and the American Concrete Paving Association. We will be um, rolling this out in January of 2018. Um, big splash will be at the Transportation Research Board uh, meeting. It's not necessarily um, our, our prime audience at the Transportation Research Board, but uh, many of the folks that do uh, go there are consultants and, and folks at the DOT level that if they know that this is available can get the word out um, to jurisdictions that, that they're in. So uh, this will be launched in, again in January. Um, again, it covers designs for parking, streets, industrial applications using either jointed plain concrete, continuously reinforced, uh, and roller compacted concrete. And we, know, we can also do pavement designs for composite pavements. That's um, typically that's pavements with a, a rigid uh, base material like a lean concrete or a cement treated base with either an asphalt or a concrete uh, top on it. And then also full depth re reclamation and concrete overlay. So a very comprehensive uh, design uh, website. It's free. Um, so it'll be out there free, supported by all three uh, associations, <clears throat> and you can, uh, we'll also be capturing uh, those folks that use it. They'll be registering to use the website, 
um, so that they can save their designs and also print out their designs. Uh, we also have what we call our, our street and road technical assistance resource. Um, when we go out and promote and we get people to select a ready mix product for their paving, what we find is many times they don't have the technical resources available to them to be able to do a successful project. Um, whether it's design it correctly, specify the materials and construction uh, correctly, uh, choose the right concrete mixtures, during construction, uh, you know, how to do QCQA test and inspection. All of that kind of stuff many times can be lacking. Um, and so we wanted to put together a resource manual that was specific to those local types of projects. Many times they'll use DOT specifications or DOT design methodologies that really are not applicable to the local road network. And so we have this resource available to um, the public it's it's on our concrete promotion website it is on the pave ahead website so it is out there for folks to utilize um, we will be looking um, for jurisdictions where we can adopt uh, where we can get them to adopt the technical research uh, guide we have 12 listed here uh, selection was based primarily on uh, factors like our current relationships that we have in the region what the current market is there um, whether the dot uh, utilizes concrete that type of thing so we chose these um, initial 12 we still have some more vetting to do with this list so it may change a little bit but really the goal is to have these 12 jurisdictions or similar uh, adopt the resource guide in the coming year. So we'll be working towards that goal in 2018. We still continue to support the Concrete Sustainability Hub at MIT, uh, both uh, financially through the Research Foundation and technically as uh, co-chairs um, with uh, industry folks in the technical uh, affairs committees. Um, recently, uh, just wanna highlight some of the recent work that, that's been going on. Um, MIT has looked at this idea of uh, inter-industry competition and how in, an indus or in a market area, if you have uh, industry competition, that uh, unit bid prices are more favorable to the agencies selecting materials. <clears throat> so they have um, continued some work that ACPA started several years ago, and, and we have um, some data sheets on that, what they call tech briefs. Um, these are short one to two page briefs about the work that they've done. And we, we can adopt that competition um, message to take out to the jurisdictions that we go and talk to as well. Uh, also looking at various ways to improve asset management and network analysis using some of the modeling te techniques and uncertainty, inclusion of uncertainty into those modeling techniques. Uh, we've been working on um, communicating that to state DOTs and also getting state DOTs to implement. And we have in fact had um, several, uh, about a half a dozen or so state DOTs that that are kind of looking at the work that MIT has done and how that they can implement it. And then lastly, one of the things that they've recently uh, concluded was some work on albedo and how light colored, colored uh, pavements reduce uh, environmental impacts. And so we have, again, some tech briefs that talk about the benefits of utilizing uh, light colored uh, pavements. Last thing I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, advocacy and, and what we do in the local paving division. Our advocacy program isn't quite as formalized as it is with the Build with Strength, um, where they look specifically at going um, into market areas and changing codes and standards and things of that nature. But we do um, uh, uh, participate with uh, other members or other like-minded associations through coalitions like the ones that are listed here. Periodically, we add our support to various legislative activities through these coalitions, and, and we've done that a, a few times uh, over this past year. I do want to highlight a couple of um, things that we've done on the advocacy side, uh, and one was 
to provide some support to the California Nevada Cement Association in support of the City of uh, Los Angeles uh, Council motion that to look at assessing rehabilitating some of their existing concrete streets there in LA with concrete, where in the past they've used asphalt overlays. Um, and this motion, uh, it's a direct result of a pavement assessment that, that we did conducted in a, in a suburb of uh, LA called Hancock Park. We did it in 2014. The Homeowners Association there contacted CNCA to see how the industry could help them kind of change the mind of the city from doing these asphalt overlays. They, th this is an old historic community. The, the pavements there are, are upwards of 90 years old. And finally, the city is getting to the point where they needed to rehabilitate the, the city streets. And they were just going to come in and do some asphalt overlays. And, and the members of the Homeowners Association did not like that. They liked their concrete street. Um, they liked the benefits that they saw from it. It made um, their their uh, uh, their streets kind of stand out from others around them. And so they wanted to maintain concrete streets. So we went in and we helped them assess all of their streets. Uh, and they had streets that looked like they were in decent shape to to ones that were in not so good a shape to other areas that were in very, very poor shape. Um, but I go back to this picture here. I don't know, you probably can't see it very well. It doesn't come through very well. But the thing to note about this, this is a very, very old street, concrete street, built with no joint. They built it and didn't joint it. Um, and it is, like I said, it, it's upwards of 90 years old. You can see some of those transverse cracks there. but. Um, the concrete performed really, really well. Uh, in other areas, um, you know, after 90 years with all of the utility cuts and things that they had, um, uh, they needed better rehabilitation. So uh, we put together some cost estimates for them and, and the city council person really has taken this and run with it and, and they wanna see concrete used uh, more readily in, in the city of LA and they have a motion to do that. Another thing that we did was at the request of the uh, Massachusetts Concrete and Aggregates um, Association, uh, John Hansen testified in support of, uh, of Senate Bill 1966. And this is a bill that institutes life cycle cost analysis for these uh, Massachusetts DOT projects where the total payment cost exceeds a million dollars. Um, the, uh, we testified at the Joint Transportation Committee and once it uh, gets pushed out of there, then it will go um, to the Senate and, and to the House for, um, uh, I guess, resolution and then, and then vote. Uh, one of the things that's interesting in, in that um, bill is that it requires the department to build a minimum of four concrete pavement projects per year for a minimum of 10 years. And that's really to develop that historical concrete payments, payment performance data that they need to, to actually do the life cycle cost analysis. They, they have not done concrete pavements in such a long time that they just don't have data collected on life, rehabilitation, and all the costs associated with those things. So those are the things that we've done from the advocacy side. I wanna move now to um, the outlook for 2018. I've asked a, a couple of our vice presidents, John Hanson and Phil Kresge, uh, to cover a couple of things. And the first will be John Hanson talking about uh, what we plan to do in 2018 in terms of our contractor partnering. So John, I'm gonna hand the screen over to you. Thanks, Brian. While you're doing it, I'll just check the audio. Can you hear me okay? I can. Very good. All right, I can see your screen. Great. Well, you've heard us talk a lot today about contractor partnering and the value of having contractors engage with us as we pursue these projects. And we, you've heard us say many, many times we can go out and promote and we can talk to decision makers, but unless we have contractors show up to bid the work and bid it properly and bid it competitively, all that work of promotion is for naught. So in the next session here, section of this session, I wanna to talk to you about some success stories that have come about in working with contractors 
And I want to appeal to you to look at these stories and realize that every one of these stories can be duplicated anywhere in the United States. The other thing I want you to realize is that the three stories you're going to see in this section, these contractors are all located within probably two or 300 miles of each other. So we hear this, well, we're going to not have enough business in a market and uh, there's not going to be enough to go around. But what we're finding is that once the process starts and people start to see it and understand it, it becomes easier to promote and sell more concrete. If you don't have concrete in a market like we, we don't have in Boston, as Brian just alluded to, it's pretty hard to convince people to do things in concrete without a lot of work. But once that process starts and people start to see the difference between paving materials, they then say, we like that and we want to have it too. So I want to show you just three examples here of work that we've done. And it's part of the whole team effort of working with contractors through the years. And I'll start with the newest one first. And many of you might have met this gentleman at Concrete Works. His name is Dylan Milas. He runs a company called Milas Flatwork in Wisconsin. He is an ASCC member. Young man, been in business uh, maybe four or five years at the most, was doing work. He's an engineer, was doing work for the city of Milwaukee and in Appleton, was running their concrete division in street inspections and decided to go on his own some years ago. And he started out primarily doing agricultural work because there's a lot of pit work that's done in the Wisconsin area in um, open types of, of uh, agricultural work. And it's fairly um, uh, easy work and fairly fast work. And there's a great amount of demand for it. So it was easy for him to get into that. He had heard about our parking lot boot camp in 2016. And many of you have heard the story. Phil and I were in uh, that part of Wisconsin. He heard about our boot camp through one of our partner members of Samaro. You're gonna hear that name a lot as we move forward, the laser screen people and called us and would not allow us to leave town before we met him to have dinner with him and two thirds of his entire company at the time. Him and his fiance, who is now his wife. And now he had a third person when he wanted to do the boot camp. We said, we typically don't do them for people that small. You have to pay for it. Brian showed you the cost estimates a little bit ago. He said, we wanna go ahead and we wanna move forward. I want to get out of the agricultural business and I want to start doing some better work. I want to get into uh, working for owners and I believe parking lots is the way to do it. We see a big opportunity. So he started in uh, 2016 after we did the boot camp, and he started showing us some of the, the uh, success of his parking lot endeavors. The photo on the left is a large trucking company that was committed to doing asphalt. He got out and got a chance to talk to him was able to put a price together for him. And you can actually pull this project up on YouTube if you'll simply go to YouTube and Google Milas Flatwork. That project will be there. You'll see it being paved. It's a, um, a parking lot for a trucking facility, a new facility there. And it's a really nice project. If you look at the one on the right, uh, we love this uh, because this was just posted um, just a few days ago, as you can see, November 2nd on his Facebook page. And um, he makes a point in talking about this small parking lot that they did. It was the same price because they were able to incorporate a monolithic curb into their placement of the concrete instead of having a subcontractor come in, place the curb first, as would be the case with an asphalt parking lot. He did it as he, placed the entire project and made the curve monolithic with the pavement. We chuckled at this because this is a line right out of boot camp. These are things we talk about in boot camp of how you compete by just changing the way you're doing things and putting a monolithic curve in place is one thing that we talk about of uh, really reducing some costs using concrete. He's also got involved in overlay projects. On the left-hand side, you see a 80,000 square foot overlay project he did for a doctor's office. He's told the story many times of how he met with the doctor. They worked on scheduling and the clinic manager 
Uh, they prepped this during the week. They paved it over the weekend and had the office back open again on Monday morning for the patients to come in. And these are the types of, of um, prep work and questions uh, that are being answered and asked by a contractor who aggressively goes after this work. He had a goal and he told us uh, late uh, last year and early part of this year that he wanted to keep expanding his business and get a second laser guided screed. You see that in the right hand picture here. He just took delivery of that at the end of October, posted it again on Facebook and said, I can't wait to get out there and expand my business uh, with now this second laser guided screed. Now friends, these are not timid investments. When you go out and make an investment in a laser guided screen like this, you're spending um, somewhere around three to four hundred thousand dollars to put this piece of equipment into play in your business. But he has seen the growth that's come about in just a couple of short years in his parking lot business that he could justify that. Well, what's that been worth? And you heard the term incremental business to our producer members in his area just since 2016. He sent me a note the other day and he says, since 2016, since we did our first boot camp, we have done right at 500,000 square feet of parking lot paving, that being both in new construction and in overlays. And we equate that we used about 10,000 cubic yards of concrete in the last year and a half to do that. So we have a producer or a number of producers up there in that area who have picked up now 10,000 additional yards of concrete in the past year and a half because this young man saw the opportunity in parking lots and started to do them in his area. So let's move on and take a look at another case study, not too far away. Our first interaction with this gentleman, Chris Cardinal, was in 2009. His dad had been a wall contractor in this market for a number of years and convinced young Chris, as you can see him there in the lower left-hand picture, uh, as he was going through college and uh, in his high school years, to come in and work for the company. In 2009, though, he came back and he started a paving division within Cardinal Concrete Construction. They had never done paving prior to 2009. So here was their work in 2008 as they broke it up by division. And you can see that 90% of their work came in cast in place foundations. They did 10% of flat work and zero parking lots because they did not have that paving division in place until 2009. So the flat work they did was probably done with a truss screed or some type of equipment that really didn't make them competitive in the market and only being 10% of their business. As we update now and jump ahead to 2013, they show that cast in place foundation for their company now is 49% of their market. Parking lots are now 41% of their total business. Maintenance is 4% and other flat work is now 6%. But what's interesting is how their business has changed and grown is that they look at what the investment of the laser screed has brought to them and 51% of that in 2013 was existing parking lot rehabilitation. What is that? It's overlays. They have found a niche market. They have found clients that have them come back and do multiple projects. And that is reflected in this slide. And look at these statistics. Parking lot lead generation, 13% of their business is done on being a hard bid. 32% comes from industry leads, so that would be state associations, NRMCA, but 55% of their parking lot business comes from referrals or repeat business. Now I ask you, how many of you would like to have a situation where you have 55% of your business come back from local or repeat business? And that's what's happened by having this paving division start within this company in 2009. 
what's that been worth in incremental business in 2009? Well, I do talk to this uh, young man on a on a uh, pretty regular basis, and he says we will average about 700,000 square foot of parking lot per year that we will do. And if you equate that to cubic yards, it's about 13,000 cubic yards of incremental business that producers in that area are getting off of this off of this company, this one company per year, 13,000 yards. I want to take you to our last contractor I want to talk about. And you've heard us talk time and time again about the Sudersky family and what a great model they are for parking lot construction. Uh, I have interacted with them since 2006, and they are an ASCC member, much like Milas is. Give you a brief company history. This is, you know, when you look at this, this is not an old company. This is not somebody that's been around, you know, since the 40s, 50s, and 60s. This company started in 1985. They added a paving division just in 1999. Now, Len has retired, and the company is now run by his two sons. Joe and Scott, and for those of you who have kept up with Lynn, you'll know that about 10 years ago, he decided he wanted to relocate himself into the Carolinas. He went down in the Carolinas, started a division of Sudersky down there, came back home, sold that division, has now retired, and Joe and Scott are now in charge of, of this company. You may have seen them on the front page of Concrete Contractor Magazine in 2008. I'll just tell you from left to right, that is Scott on the left, that's Len in the center, and that's Joe Swiderski on the right. Some of you may know or may not know that Joe Swiderski was uh, seriously injured in a skiing accident 10 years ago. Um, he uh, was uh, paralyzed. They didn't think he would ever walk again. He has recuperated to where the point where he now can get around uh, using a walker on short walks. He uses a wheelchair and a Segway a lot of times to get around. I point this out to you because um, I have been in situations talking about these opportunities in different parts of the country. And I hear this pushback of, well, that may work there, it won't work here. And I say, look at Joe Swiderski and tell me what your excuse is that it won't work in your area. I want you to take a look at the screen on the right-hand side though, and take a look at the four screens in Joe's office. And I will bring to your attention on the left screen is their logo. On the middle screen is the CPA input data sheet. And on the right screen is a CPA graph. You talk about a contractor who has completely engaged with NRMCA programs and they run CPA information across on every project and use what we have shown them as their best bet. What's SCI been worth to our members um, in incremental business since 1999? We have not gone back and figured it out, but we know it's lots and lots of yards. They numerous times during the, during the year will use our design assistance program. They were the inspiration of our jointing program. Uh, Joe called one day and says, I need to have a jointing plan done and everybody's busy. Can we get it done? And, and uh, we had Amanda work with him and the Jointing Plan Assistance Program came as an outgrowth of a idea that Joe Swiderski got us. I told you I didn't know what they were worth to us in incremental business since 1999, but I can tell you last week alone in working with them on a project that they will start this fall, that it was 37,000 cubic yards that will be started this fall and move into 2018. That's just last week's work. So have we learned something working with contractors? Obviously we have. We've also learned that there are places across the United States that are not engaged with contractors through their state affiliates or they're not getting local help. And as Brian talked to you earlier about ASCC contractors and outreach contractors, you will see us go now and take these programs and these success stories as uh, and take them to contractors 
and move this needle and say, we have our producer members who may not be getting this support through their state associations. We are going to offer it to you in conjunction with our local producer members in helping you move that market. And we're going to uh, be doing it in uh, a promotion, education, training, boot camp, ASCC joint committees. We're going to roll all this up. We're going to duplicate the success because it's yards on the ground. And we're taking that contractor and making them part of the equation. And Brian, I will pass this back to you. Excellent. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, all right. So we've seen a little bit how we're going to uh, focus on the contracting community next year. Another part of that and an integral part of that is going to be uh, concrete overlays. We see that as being uh, an area in which we can um, win yardage. And so I've asked uh, Phil Kresge to kind of take us through uh, plans for 2018 for our concrete overlay program. So Phil, passing to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, just to give you some a little bit of background on uh, what we've been doing uh, in the overlay market. Uh, it, it's it's a pretty lucrative market, I think, is, is an easy, uh, easy description. Going back to Brian's slide earlier in the program, he talked about 225 million cubic yards uh, annually in the parking lot market. Uh, 1.3 million of that is is easily overlays. If you think of all the that that 90 percent of the pavement that we miss each year uh, has a chance to come back to us uh, around year seven to ten, and we see that overlay market as a huge opportunity and something that, that needs to be capitalized. Such a great opportunity that we developed with the help of the RMC Research and Education Foundation working with the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center, the Green Book, as we call it, the Guide to Concrete Overlays of Asphalt Parking Lots. Uh, a great, uh, a well-needed document because as we started to push the concrete parking lot overlay market, we were relying on overlay books that were initially written for streets and roads. And the same argument that we've made over and over about ACI 330 being for parking lots Ashto being for streets and roads, it kind of we we sort of contradicted ourselves by not having this book. So this book is, in in my estimation, this is probably one of the best pieces to ever come out of the Concrete Pavement Tech Center and with funding of the RMC Research and Education Foundation because it's just so perfect. It's a soup to nuts description of what to do. Uh, one contractor engineer in the California area, uh, we got wind of a project that he had completed. And John Hansen reached out to the gentleman and, and said, well, how many, how many of these overlays have you done before? He said, well, this was my first one. John said, how did you know what to do? And his response, a direct quote, he said, I just read the book. Everything that he needed was in this book. So we've really used this book as the basis, uh, if you will, for our overlay promotion. And as we've moved out and, and tried to take the message to our audience, we've had to identify uh, where's the best place to find our audience. Right now, uh, our focuses have been at the International Council of Shopping Centers Recon Convention, which is held each year in Las Vegas. It is the world's largest retail real estate convention. Last year, or I should say this year in May, there were 37,000 folks in attendance. The reason we feel this is so important and such a great uh, venue for us is unlike any of the other trade shows that we go to, every one of these 37,000 people are potential customers for us. They're either owners or they're developers or they're uh, engineers who serve the community or, or that, that that community or they're the retail folks who rent the space but every one of them has is, is a potential customer for us the first cup this will be going into 2018 will be the fifth year that we've done this the first two years we kind of focused on just brand recognition we're the nrmca we're the concrete industry we're here to help we've got a lot of things that we can help you with uh the first two years we 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 thought we should be focusing on pervious concrete but 
you know, people that walked by, it was just sort of, you know, uh, touch and go. There wasn't a, a, a lot of, of uh, retention with them that we could see. But we also realized that every single person that came by our booth had one thing in common. And that was that they more than likely owned or managed an existing asphalt parking lot that was in need of repair. And so the last two years, uh, 2016 and 17, we put our focus at this market on concrete overlays. And just this year, we had unveiled our new uh, uh, displays uh, with our pave ahead uh, branding, uh, focusing on concrete overlays. We even had a tabletop uh, demonstration, if you will, or a, a hands-on uh, sample of exactly what we mean when we talk about a concrete overlay. Without fail, uh, just about every person who came by and stopped and started to talk to us always started off with this statement, concrete over asphalt, I didn't know you could do that. And so we realized that that part of the problem here is they didn't even know they had a choice. They always felt once they were, you know, that asphalt was pavement and that's that's where they were locked. So what we do here is we bring in uh, some of this great branded material that we have uh, through the Pave Ahead, uh, through, through our entire effort. Uh, we've got stuff focused specifically on overlays. One is a, an overview of, of overlays in general. We've got three or four case studies that are concrete overlays. We bring these in, we have this as, as uh, collateral material and some of these uh, include high profile, uh, for example, the Elway dealerships. Uh, we have retail mall, shopping malls, as you see pictured here. Uh, these, these folks tend to understand these markets. They say, hey, this is, this is the same project as I have. So there's a little bit of credibility to, to, the, to the message and having the high profile names and so on really helps as well. But the next uh, section, or the next uh, phase of this, I guess I'd say, is the next question comes up. Well, who can do this in my area? Almost every lead that we've generated, and we've generated in the last two years, we've generated more than twice as many leads as we did in the first two years combined because of this focused effort on overlays and, and the interest that's there. To, to me, when they ask this question, who can do this in my area? that's a close. They're closing themselves in the sale, if you will, because they've bought into this. And boy, I'd, I'd really like to, to do this. Who can do it in my area? And it comes back to what John's message, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> John's message earlier was about contractor partnering. We, we need to be able to provide these folks with the right people to do the job. We had a, a lead came in from 2016 and uh, we provided uh, contractor uh, information. Uh, and unfortunately, the actually the owner came back prior to this year's convention, uh, contacted John and, and was talking about things and said, you know, your contractor contradicted everything that, that you told me. You know, you said we could do this, the book says this, and, and this contractor was, was talking about something completely different. So we realized that it's important that our contractors, excuse me, that our contractors be qualified contractors. And so that comes back around to partnering with, with the right contractor folks to, part of it comes into the boot camp in, in teaching them, but, but really making sure that we can partner our producers and, and contractors together to these customers to provide them what they're looking for. We're gonna continue to move in this market, but we're also evaluating some other venues, looking at the successes we've had. You know, a couple of highest profile overlay successes we've had have been Elway dealerships, uh, the Pinehurst Golf Course, uh, a couple of other projects that have sprung off of those. So we'll, we'll evaluate possibly going to some national associations in those other venues, the National Auto Dealers Association. Also, the ICSC, the uh, Council of Shopping Centers, has various regional uh, venues, regional 
uh, conventions. Perhaps we'll take a look at focusing on those. And of course, we are the local paving division and we're going to continue to support and encourage our members and our state affiliates on the local level to move forward with this as well. Uh, school boards are a fantastic opportunity and, and that's something that's on the local level. We'll support that any way that we can. Uh, the locally owned businesses, when we teach boot camp, one of the sessions we have is identifying target markets. And the target markets for overlays are, are pretty specific. Uh, they're locally owned businesses and we want to help, uh, we want to encourage our members to go after those and we'll, we'll do whatever we can to help them. And with that, let me pass the, the present back to Brian and you can bring us home. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I hope that, that we've provided uh, the information that, that, uh, that you need in terms of what we've done this past year and, and where we plan to go for next year. Uh, I'll open it up now for questions or comments. Again, uh, you can use the raise your hand feature on your panel, your go to webinar panel, and I can unmute you and you can ask a question or if you just simply want to type a question in, you, you can do that as well. So I'll give you just a moment to uh, ask any questions you want. Brian, do we have anybody? Not currently. Uh, Rodney's got his hand up. So Rodney, let me uh, unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Rodney. Uh, you may be muted on your phone. I've unmuted you. Still can't hear you. Well, we can't hear you, Rodney, but... Um, Can you type the message if, in, Rodney? Yeah, if you want to type, try that. While we're waiting for the question, uh, Brian, good job, guys. Very good job. I, okay. Uh, and increment, you got the question? Uh, I've got one from uh, Matt. He's asked, he said, can we obtain a list of contractors with laser screeds? John, you want to take that? We have that list from Samaro. I believe that um, we have a great working relationship with Samaro. They have given me that list. I need to get their permission to share that, but I don't think that'll be a problem if you would like to send me uh, your contact information or anybody that'd like to have that, we will work on putting that together for you. And that was that was Matt Wood, right? Yeah. John, John, if you don't have that, we'll we'll make sure you get. Uh, oh yeah. Matt's I, contact. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and uh, we've got a, a question from Guy. That says, uh, do you have a list of the ASCC contractors that you could share with us? Again, uh, John, I'll ask you to, to answer that one. John sits on that uh, joint paving committee with ASCC. We do have access to that. Um, if you go to the ASCC website, without being a member, you can't get in there, but um, I can get in there and get that information um, so again, if you want to send us a note and you're looking for contractors in a specific region, I'd be more than happy to pull those off for you. Okay, excellent. Thanks, John. We'll, we'll make a note to make sure that Matt, you and Guy will get that information. Yeah. Did, uh, um, did Rod, was Rodney able to get through there? Or? Uh, I have not seen a question from Rodney yet, but John Lee has asked in terms of the concrete tracker, who should we contact in terms of adding projects, both paving and buildings, and what do you need in terms of information? That's a great question, John. Um, yeah, you can um, uh, discuss with, with the, either myself or with, um, with Lionel. We do have a uh, kind of a template um, so if there's more than, you know, a handful of projects that you want to add into Concrete Tracker, 
um, all you simply have to do is um, uh, send us that data or put it into that format that we have um, a template set for. Um, so contact either myself or, or Lionel. We'll be, we'll be glad to share that information with you and how we can get that stuff transferred back and forth. Um, oh. And, and any, anybody that wants to do that, you can t contact either one of us and we'll, uh, we'll get you what you need. Uh, Br Brian, uh, Rodney just texted me the, the message, or his question rather. Uh, okay. He wants to know, if, can we possibly get some of these contractors to come and tell their stories of how they developed their concrete concrete paving business at our committee meetings at the end at, at our coming convention and even concrete works and yeah i think we we did have dylan there this past but i think we can bring dylan back again can't we john and some other be, contractors i think he'd be he'd be more than happy to do that and i can certainly uh, uh there are others besides dylan and there may be some in in different parts of the uh, united states that we can hook up more regionally too uh yes we did bob um we had that session at Concrete Works, and that was specifically uh, to bring an ASCC contractor in and talk about the partnering with NRMCA. Um, I'm sorry if, if someone missed that session because it um, it really did address that uh, topic. And by the way, as a side note, Dylan is going to um, Tennessee now the first of the year because he was asked by Alan Sparkman, who was there, if he would come do the same thing in Tennessee that he did at Concrete Works. For the, for the Tennessee Ready Mix Association, correct. That's correct. Are, yeah, are there and, any other, go ahead. Rodney, uh, Rodney it, it also pointed out maybe at the committee meeting, I think it'd be well worth it at the promotion committee to, to spend a few minutes to have a contractor come in and, and, and talk about how they've developed their paving program uh, at the committee level as well. Okay, I, I want to comment also that that we just just as we did with the Build with Strength uh, webinar that was done last week, we did uh, inform our partners with the Portland Cement Association and also the American Concrete Paving Association to join us. I don't I don't know that they did, but uh, we we want to make sure that uh, you're aware we're constantly uh, keeping communications open with our partners. Um, Rodney's got another comment here. Uh, I think if our producer members had examples of how other contractors got into the business, it would be beneficial. And I agree, Rodney. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Very good point. Uh, and we will we'll continue to to make that a focus at our at our promotion sessions. Um, we just really see a, a benefit of, of of putting our our two heads together and, and being able to be much more competitive in a market and share knowledge with each other and, and educate each other on, on how to go after these projects. Uh, we want it, more we we want more of those people that just say I just read the book. I, I think it's yeah, no doubt. Book. No yeah. doubt. And and we we've, we've even done some some number crunching to show uh, the investment from the research foundation was around eighty thousand dollars, and and we've we've done some numbers. I, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but the, the return on that investment has been huge. Maybe, John, if you remember off the top of your head, I do remember. If you if you go back to uh, 2012 when the book hit the street, and of the known projects we've gotten, and if you take the amount of concrete and the placement cost, it's had a impact to the concrete construction industry, so producer and contractor, of about 10.4 million. On an, on an investment great. of just that's under $80,000. 10 for, yes, I'm sorry, that's that's in dollars, 10.4 million in dollars. I think, the, uh, I think, uh, I think Julie uh, Garbini's on the line. Uh, I don't know that she can comment, but uh, I, I'm gonna guess that that's a, it's a pretty good uh, ROI on uh, on that investment. I would say so. Yeah, yeah Julie, am I unmuted? unmuted. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. No, I, we definitely feel like that's one of the best investments we've ever done, and we're we're proud that it's supporting the Pave Ahead effort. Well, unless there's any other questions, uh, Brian, John, do not see any more. Yeah, good job, guys, and that'll conclude this uh, this webinar. Thank you. All right, and thanks again to Molly for, for jumping on with DDC and, and taking us through the pave ahead. So we appreciate uh, everybody's participation and look forward to doing this again soon. Thank you.